Feeding in the morning from his album, Billy Vera Big Band Jazz. With the sleepy time down south. You know, because of you, I went out and found the Louis Armstrong version of that song. Uh-huh. And I had never... I, 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 and I, I've been a Louis Armstrong fan since I was a kid. My dad was a big Satchmo fan. And I played the trumpet. And, you know, you play, you grew up playing the trumpet. You, you grew up listening to I didn't to know Armstrong. you played trumpet. Yeah. And uh, uh, I'm a card carrying member of Local 47, the Musicians Union, and uh, I can't play very can't fl- play very well uh, since August. But uh, you couldn't play very well before August. <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, we had stop Chris, using that as an we had, excuse. We had Chris Bodie in the studio, and, and Chris and Chris said, "Can you still play?" And I said, "I don't know." He handed me his trumpet. He oh man, wiped off the. Uh, he said, "Can you hit a high C?" And I. Boy, immediately I hit the high C. Carry a tune, you know. I could. Louis Armstrong. Yeah. You, you, you have introduced us to so much um, music. Not only music, but music history, important stuff. You know, who, who, who made this music big, and and this album. I mean, you, you did. You know, I, I told the story. Smokey Robinson coming down to the studio. Uh, he wanted to do a, a standards album that eventually became his timeless love album. But he said, "I want to do songs that haven't been done and done and done." And you did. You took did that. the same thing. I well, want to do songs that nobody, that, yeah. that everybody else didn't do. Yeah. Because why put out another, uh, yet another version of the same old songs that everybody else does? Yeah. So you you said out you had a theme in mind. Well, I came up with a theme. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, somebody said to me, "Well, what is it that you know better than anybody else?" And I said, "Well, I I grew up in black show business, you know, playing the Apollo and all that mm-hmm. stuff." And I said, "I know black music pretty well." I said, "Ah, sure, of course, the great songs of the Great American Songbook that were written by black songwriters, but people don't didn't don't know that, and and they should know that. They should. So I, I you know, that was my whole theory of 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 this album. Yeah. I feel I feel much better." As we take this musical journey, I feel better knowing some of the some of the stories. Like the you told us a story once about how that song, uh, when it's sleepy time down south, how that came to re- be recorded. By I did Louis tell you Armstrong. that before. I was just gonna I was just gonna ask you if I told you that one before. And that was uh, uh, the 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 guys that wrote it uh, came to L. A. to meet with Louis Armstrong. Well, no, no, Louis came to L. A. to play at uh, Sebastian's Cotton Club in uh, Culver City. Uh, and uh, and Leon Rene, who wrote the song with his brother, uh, they were a couple of Creoles from New Orleans. Mm-hmm. And uh, the third writer on there is a guy named Clarence Muse, who, if you like old movies, you may have seen him playing uh, railroad porters and those really? kind of roles, you know. And uh, and so Leon uh, knew that Louis liked uh, red beans and rice, and uh, and Leon's wife made really good red, red beans, beans and rice. So he invited him over to the house for dinner. And after dinner, he says, oh, by the way, I got a song for you. And Louis listened to it and loved it, and, uh, and that became his uh, his opening song for many, many, many years. Uh, uh, you know, I would have never probably, uh, maybe I would have eventually, but I doubt I would have ever heard the Louis Armstrong version of that song, if it weren't for Billy Vera, one of the things that we that we love and our listeners come in on, yeah, when you come into the studio, we learn something. Well, that's good, man. Not only are we entertained, <laughs> but we're in, we're informed, we're enlightened. Louis Armstrong oh, on Martini in the Morning dot com. Martini in the Morning dot com. Satchmo, Louis Armstrong. You know, only Billy Vera. Only with Billy Vera in the studio can we can we do we play songs by other artists. We've done that to you before. We I, I think yeah, but we, at least you play artists that I love, like Satchmo. You know, I love your I love your posts. We were um, uh, sometime back. You it was Patty Patty Labelle's birthday or something, and you had mentioned that you played with uh, that you had opened. I played with them a lot with the yeah. Bluebells. Yeah, and and we had um, a year or so ago we had Landau Eugene Murphy in the studio. He was a 2011 uh, America's Got Talent winner, and his one of the things he got to do as a finalist, he got to pick who he wanted to do a duet with, <laughs> and he picked Patty Labelle. And wow. and son of a gun, if she didn't come on the show, he sang. I forget what song they did together, but but. Uh, um, it was amazing. It's it's amazing to watch your posts on Facebook because I learn about them. You know, I mean, I know a little about 
Patty LaBelle and Bluebells, I know about the hits that mm-hmm. they had and, and so on. But I very, yeah, I, I think I, I think I the only songs I've ever played by her um, over Hercule. the rainbow probably. And yeah. and and her her when I was in Top Forty Radio, I played her duet with Michael McDonald. Oh, that was a great record. And yeah. then I played uh, Lady Marmalade. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Lon Price from my band, from the Beaters and my big band is on that record. Really? Yeah, he was living in New Orleans at the time. That was, I mean, that was a huge hit. Uh, so I know, I know the surface stuff, but, but thanks to uh, to Billy Vera, um, what? You have to wear it. You have to do something because I can't stand this. You look what? like you put your finger in a socket. Take off your headphones and then put them back on again. <laughs> take off your headphones. No, no, no. Take them off. Take them off. Now go ahead. Go for it. Yeah, that's better. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. yeah. this is what I get every. Yeah. Or had to do it. Sometimes she'll hand me a tissue and she'll say, "You got a booger." We're in the air. We're at the We're air. In the air. You could say booger on the radio. Huh? Um, listen, yeah. back Billy. Back in Johnny Fever's days, you couldn't say that. That's why he got fired. It's uh, how he ended up in Cincinnati. He'd been here in L.A. The story goes that he was here. He was working in L.A. He said boogers on the air and he got fired. I don't blame him. You know, you know Bob words, Wills you. and the Texas Playboys had a song called Booger Lou. Boogerloo. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know. This is really disgusting. <laughs> Wait a minute. Can we just that talk takes, about something? That, take, that takes me back to my country days. Uh, 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 we worked with uh, Ray Benson. And oh, I love Ray. And, and Sleep at the Wheel. And we uh, they did a Bob Wills tribute. And uh, uh, Ray is a big Bob Wills aficionado. And... Uh, where he's also a major pot smoker. You Ray follows you around. He'll be at sound check and he'll follow. Around. Hey Brad, do you want to go burn one? <laughs> he's a good friend of mine. Is, we, we were on the good board to of directors on the air. Ray and I were on the board of directors of the Rhythm and Blues Foundation for a long he's time. He's an together. amazing, amazing talent, and and um, and every time I've had a chance to see him play. Anyway, he did, one of the songs that made the the Bob, Bob Wells tribute album was a song called mm-hmm. and George. Straight sang it, it's play on words, uh, which they were famous for. Uh, big balls in count in Cowtown. <laughs> right. It was a, so you know you, you you can say anything as long as it's in the right context. I want to talk about Billy's um, uh, upcoming show, show at Catalina. At Catalina. Jazz. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're going to be two a, days from night. Today. Big, big, big band, night. right? You're going to be with a big band, big eighteen piece band, 18 Billy piece Vera band, big band. Right? At, uh, Catalina's Jazz Club. What time Club, does the show start on 8 30. 8 30. PM. Yeah. I, one we, show or two shows? Just one. One show. Yeah, one yeah. show. And uh, it's, oh, it's a make lot reservations. of fun. There. And Tamala might be guest. She's going to sing a couple of songs with us. Tamala and I'm going to do a couple of Sinatra songs for his birthday. This How's this that? time, I mean, this, and, and, and with the. We get a little a little jaded because we've been playing Frank Sinatra, you know, since we started. Mm. But this is kind of the time that everybody says, "Hey, Frank, thanks for the well, yeah, it's you the know, twelve, yeah, music. man." Are you going to do Christmas music? Any Christmas We're gonna music? We're going to do. Tamla and I are going to do a duet of uh, White Christmas. Oh, oh that ought to be okay. good. Yeah. You, um, um, as, yeah. As far as Frank Sinatra, you've you've wor- you've done some Frank Sinatra stuff before. Well, I did, uh, yeah, the last, I produced uh, or co-produced four Lou Rawls albums. We kind of brought mm. back his career in 1989. And the last album I did with him, uh, which unfortunately was the last album of his life, mm. uh, was uh, called Rawls Sing Sinatra. And I had I to do that album. all Sinatra out songs. I don't remember that album. And I was a big fan of Little Rawls. Yeah, it was it was in 2000, I don't know, three or five, somewhere around there. And it was on Savoy Records, the yeah. old jazz label. Yeah, yeah. Because believe it or not, Lou couldn't get a record deal at that time. Really? His manager, who was a friend of mine, David Brokaw, uh, he called me up one day. He said, "He said, man, because uh, we hadn't recorded him in about three, four years. Uh, we were because before that we had him on Blue Note. And uh, David said, uh, man, you, I can't get Lou a deal. I said, he said, you got, he said, you got any ideas? I said, well, man, so, you know, sometimes, a, you know, I'm not above using a gimmick. And uh, sometimes two names are better That's than one. one. Yeah. I said, how about Old Brown Eyes sings Old Blue Eyes? I like it." 
Well, this, the label didn't like my title. Well, I, yeah, <laughs> but but the idea. But they liked the. They went for the idea, and uh, we got. I got Benny Golson to write charts. You know, the great Benny Golson, the, who's one of the greatest arrangers on the planet. And uh, we went into Capitol and uh, and cut the album, and and uh, it was on the charts, jazz charts for six months. It was a great album, uh, and I got to see Lou around the time. Last time, uh, last time I saw him perform was around the time that that album came out, mm. and he and he just smoked it. You, you could you could say, tell something was was wrong. But what did he, he was starting from? to get the cancer, yeah, yeah. cancer in his throat. You yeah. know, I met, I, I met Lou at Catalina Jazz Club, mm. and Lou walk, walked up. I've been on stage to introduce your twin, Steve Tyrell, <laughs> and uh, and I said, you know, we get we get this guy, we get this guy doing, saying, now that's music, and people are calling on us and saying, is that Billy Vera? No. Is that Lou Rawls? No. <laughs> it's Steve, it's and, and I introduced Steve Tyrell, and. So about halfway through the show, I feel this hand on my shoulder. This is the old Catalina. It was, yeah. it was dark in the room. This hand on my shoulder and this booming voice. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> they think I sound like him. <laughs> and it was uh, nobody's. Uh, you know. You know. David Brokaw told me one time. He, I don't know how they uh, figured this stuff out, but he said Lou had the third most recognizable voice. Not in America, in the world. It doesn't surprise me. It doesn't. Uh, right after Muhammad Ali and Howard Cosell. Um, what's <laughs> Howard what's, Cosell. What, songs, I mean, what Frank Sinatra songs are you going to do? I'm going to do uh, Nice and Easy, uh -huh. and I'm going to do In the Wee Small Hours of the Moon. Oh. That's, uh, what, what songs did you include on the, uh, on the Lou Rawls album? Well, we did. I don't remember. We did uh, "Come Fly with Me." We did. You know what I did was I, I on Facebook I asked uh, I asked the fans. I said, uh, you know, tell me some. I, I want to know what the the older people that grew up with Frank uh -huh. liked their, your favorite songs, and and younger people, what do you like? Well, the younger people all wanted to hear Lou sing "Summer Wind," so I I, I, I used that one, and the older people. Uh, they wanted to hear the the wee small hours is and the all the ways and the uh, second times around and, and uh, you know a lot of those great. Ah, uh, count, count me with the young ones. Lou Rawls, produced by Billy Vera, Martini in the morning. Summer wind came blowing in. Martini in the morning dot com. It's uh, Steve Mangini from uh, Manchester, England. Uh, he appreciates that. Uh, Hi, Steve. Billy Billy Vera production. <laughs> yeah. uh, we were all. Oh, I was telling uh, Billy off the air that uh, that we launched uh, the old radio station on on Frank Sinatra's birthday in two thousand two, and that album came out not long after that. And somebody sent me a copy of that, and I thought, okay. This this format has some legs. Lou Rawls singing, you know <laughs> these these songs. Um, when you do the show Wednesday night, uh, uh, Tamala is coming back from England, uh, India. from India. You mm -hmm. two you two did it. Uh, our friend Tamala uh, D'Amico, we talked about earlier. Uh, you two did a duet on the song, and you said told Mother Miriam that you're doing a Christmas song together. We're going to do White Christmas mm -hmm. yeah. together, yeah, Drifter style. Really? Yeah. I mean, that's really the music you grew up uh, on. Oh yeah. You know. Well, you know, the thing is, I had a mother who was a singer. Uh, she was uh, in the Ray Charles right. Singers on the Perry Como show, yeah. and she she was hip, you know. So she'd bring home, you know, Frank Sinatra, Nancy Wilson, all these great records, Duke Ellington. So at the same time, I'm listening to Chuck Berry and Little Richard and Fats Domino and Frankie Lyman. Mm -hmm. I'm also listening. To songs for swinging lovers and songs for young lovers mm -hmm. and Duke Ellington Uptown and you know all all this that hip stuff. So I, I, my my influences are all over the place. You you did you and Tamala on your big band jazz album and and she's doing the the song with you. You did uh, a song that. That Dinah Washington did with uh, who did she do it with? Well, Dinah did it alone. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, but uh, the, the 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 hit ver the original version was by Lucky Millinder's band, and then uh, it got covered by my my dear friend Paul Gayton with a, the greatest undiscovered female singer you'll ever hear, Annie Laurie. They had the hit with it, and then it was covered for the pop market by Ernie uh, Ford and K Star. And it just—it was a much, much covered song. Was it? Was it? Uh, 
high on the list when when you sat down. I mean, you did how many songs in this album? Ten. So when you sat down and whittled it down to ten, how high was this song on your list? It was pretty high because uh, when Paul died, uh, his wife asked me to sing it at his funeral. Oh, so you'd done it before? I had done it before alone. Uh, it, it's it's one it's a song obviously since Dinah did it alone it doesn't have to be right. done with as a duet and uh, uh, so and in fact I got Lou to come and sing a hymn at Paul Gaten's really funeral. yeah Paul was very well loved uh, and Teddy Edwards do you know who Teddy is? yeah I know the name I had, uh, Teddy Teddy was a dear friend of Paul Gaten's and Teddy wrote me the chart for for the for the funeral and uh, and he couldn't he couldn't bring himself to come to the funeral he was so broken up uh, so I, I I wanted to do it in uh, in tribute to Paul Gayton Billy Vera Tamela Dabinko I'll never be free on martini in the morning you'd be this jockey on martini in the morning dot <laughs> com that's uh, an amazing television and they're good it's, with recording. It's martini in the morning dot com <laughs> and uh, Billy Vera and Tamela D'Amico. So, so you used, I mean, you used some guys that you've done for a long time on this album. Yeah, I, I well, I used uh, uh, Daryl Leonard, who I mentioned before, who used to be in the Beaters, and I used uh, uh, two current Beaters. I used Terry Landry on baritone sax, and of course Lon Price, who's been with me for thirty five, thirty six years. <laughs> Since I started the Beaters, every time every time we have you in, people people say, "Are he and Lon Price still working together?" Yeah, because I can't there get are videos there are videos floating around <laughs> of you guys. I mean, early, early yeah. in your time with the Beaters, when when he had dark hair and I had hair, <laughs> some hair. <laughs> it's Martini in the morning, Billy Vera Wednesday night, Catalina Jazz Club in Hollywood. Eight thirty is the show. Uh, Eight thirty p.m. and big band. I yeah, mean, I'm going to bring out. I'm going to feature uh, Lon. Lon wrote the, um, a, an astounding chart, a big man chart for Thelonious Monks around midnight. Oh, really? And he oh, plays yeah, the living so. bejesus out of that. Really? So, yeah. And I, so I'm going to, in the middle of the show, I'm going to step off. You sing it? Feature, no, no. I, I'm stepping off and letting Lon shine. There. Would he sing it? No, he's going to play. He's just going to play, it, play it, but no one's going to sing it. Love that song. Oh yeah. The fabulous, fabulous lyrics. It, it's a great yeah. song. It, yeah. um, last time uh, we seen Billy do the big band show at uh, Catalina Jazz Club a couple of times, and it's always it's a great show. It's very entertaining. You don't see that many big band shows anymore. Sad to say, you know, it's it was expensive. expensive. You know, I mean, I mean, I, 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 most of the time I don't even break even. You know, uh, hmm. I got to I got to practically sell out the club. Really, to to, uh, to break even because you got eighteen guys, you got to pay them. Yeah, you know they don't do this because they like it. I mean, they love it. They do love it. See, but, everybody but, thinks you're making a fortune there. Nah, there, being nah. a performer, people don't know. I do it. I do it because I I, I love it. So that's for selfish reasons. Uh -huh. And then for altruistic reasons, I do it because I, I want the world to hear this music. You know, hear the, hear the big bands. These are great. I mean, these are great songs. You you kind of had this dream of doing a big band album. Yeah, for about 20 years. Yeah, I wanted to do it, and I, 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 no record company was going to let me do it. So I procrastinated and procrastinated. And, uh, and then suddenly some people started doing them, you know. I, I remember one day I, I get a phone call some years ago, and I started getting a lot of phone calls. In fact, says, man, you finally put out that, that, uh, that big band album you were, you've been talking about. I said, no, no, what are you talking about? What do you mean? I said, yeah, man, that's you. I heard you on the radio. And I said, believe me, it's not me. I don't know who it is, but it ain't me. And then I found out it was Steve Tyrell. <laughs> You guys do there. That's there funny. is a certain similarity to your style. Well, we, went to, we went to different schools together. Yeah, exactly. You know? Steve went to school in Houston and and, and grew up playing R and B. Um, and in fact, Steve introduced us to uh, uh, Burt Bacharach years ago. Mm. And uh, uh, Burt Bacharach, I mean, everybody. When, when you think of Burt, Burt Bacharach and Hal David, do you think of you know Dionne Warwick songs? Do you know the way to San Jose or Raindrops? Keep keep falling on my head. But he he's got some. Some R and B inside him. 
Hoot Burt. Yeah. Oh, my God. The first Dionne Warwick record, uh, Don't Make Me Over, is a stone R&B yeah. record, you know. Uh, it, it's it's what, we, what we now call Sweet Soul. Sweet Soul? I like that. You know, because Benny King... Uh, Spanish Harlem. That's Sweet Soul. Chuck Jackson. Any day now. Sweet Soul. What is uh, what is uh, Ray Charles? Ray Dead. Charles is Ray Charles. <laughs> Ray, you know, Ray Charles. Else, Wait, baby. what did you say? Dead man. Dead That's man. not nice. Ray Charles is God. <laughs> you and Steve are going to do a duet. Yeah, we're going to we're going to record uh, Busted. For, really? For Steve's doing a, a, a Ray Charles tribute. Ray yeah. Charles tribute. He played. He played uh, right after I had the stroke. Steve was our first uh, our first guest in the studio. He couldn't understand a word I said, <laughs> and so I let him do all the docking. And uh, uh, he that brought, must have been hard for you because you like to talk. Brother. I like to talk. <laughs> I, I've been I've been talking all my life. You be quiet. I'm not saying a word. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was it was it was very hard. And uh, but Steve brought in some some rough cuts of the yeah. the Ray Charles tribute. Good stuff. I man. mean, as long as I've known Steve, which it goes back 12, 13 years, uh, he is you know he has made it very clear that Ray Charles is the man. Oh, he is. I no mean, question. Steve and Steve and his wife, uh, his late wife Stephanie, wrote a song. In fact, the Ray cut uh, mm. called "Big Love." Wow. And uh, that was a you know crowning achievement. What a thrill! Yeah, and in fact, Ray is the reason that Steve ended up in, in the movie "Father the Bride." Uh, Steve did a scratch track of the way you look tonight. He sent it to Ray's people because he wanted Ray to do it in the movie. And Ray hadn't gotten back to him. They had to test the movie before a live audience, and the audience kept saying, "Who is that?" Singing the way you look tonight. That they they, they didn't know the song. He was playing it for you know they were playing the, the movie for little girls. And uh, anyway, uh, so Steve ended up doing the way you look tonight. But you and Steve, you and Steve first, I, at least to, to my knowledge, your first duet was at our show that we did. Yeah, we we sang "Stand by Me" together at your show. That was fabulous. Was Thank a, God we have that on tape. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we get do. videos. Of. I love Steve. You know, he, he's just such a supportive guy. Mm -hmm. You know, he 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 plays my my album on his radio show yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. He, I know he's a he's a big fan, and and we've we've talked about you many times about the comparisons because because people started talking from the time that we put Steve on the radio, uh, people said, "Is it Billy Vera?" You know, do, doing uh, doing the you know doing the good because back then you were doing the AM PM commercials. I, I still think. do. Sixteen years. Really? AM PM. AM PM. Too much good stuff. You know. Uh, you do sound alike. The kid, the, the kid <laughs> yeah. that plays Frankie Valli on Broadway. I asked him his new album. Uh, Joseph Leo Worry's a new album is called The Good Stuff. I uh -huh. said, I said, maybe you ought to call Billy Billy Vera. He might have a you know trademark on that or copyright <laughs> on that. Um, when you do the show at uh, Catalina Jazz Club Wednesday night, um, Billy Vera Big Band Jazz uh, will be front and center. What's your if you if you had to pick a song from the album? Oh do man, you, do you have a favorite? Well, you you already played my very favorite, which is Sleepy, Sleepy Time. Time. I, I love that one, but I I also uh, I also love um, uh, 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 if I could be with you uh, at the great James P. Johnson, the great stride pianist. The master of them all. I, I love that one a lot too. Billy Vera, Wednesday night, Catalina Jazz Club in Hollywood. Telephone number is 323 466 2210 for reservations. Billy Vera from his album Billy Vera Big Band Jazz. If I could be with you on Martini in the morning .com, we can be with uh, Billy Vera Wednesday night at Catalina Jazz Club in Hollywood. Um, has this has this opened new new doors, new new horizons? Recording this album. Well, I get to I get to play in New York. Get to go home and see my old friends. I, I've been playing at a club there called Iridium. Iridium, uh, yeah. which is I'll be there May fifteenth again. And uh, you know we sell out there. You know I mean I haven't lived there in thirty years. But people keep we come back and see it. Well, you don't have to live there. They know you. They're just happy that you came home. You are the the king of social media. I mean, <laughs> nobody uses social. Uh, this morning, there's a post about Billy Vera about the uh, the, the show, show yeah. and it, it's a parrot. 
And a couple of days ago, there's a picture of a girl of a, of a cute girl holding a copy of the album. I get all these pretty girls that, that that they'll send me pictures of them holding my album, and so I post it and I'll say uh, I'll say Miriam says uh, I love Billy Bear blah blah blah. Perfect. Or, or today, but this other lady sent me a picture of her her white parrot uh, uh, sit, standing next to my. Album. That's adorable. So I, I post it. You know, people people like that kind of stuff. Social media is um, is is opening some new doors. We hear all the time from young people who find us, find this music through through YouTube, through you know whatever channels, and it, it's opening new tools for discovery for us you know, playing this music for you recording this music. Um, are you are, are do, you, do you find people contacting you that you don't expect that you're or maybe that you didn't expect? You know, now I expect it all. Uh, I get these twenty-two-year-old girls, uh, you know, writing and say, "Oh man, uh, thanks to you, I discovered, you know, my I discovered uh, uh, Billy Holiday or Ella Fitzgerald or Frank Sinatra or Nat Cole or whoever," and they want to talk about these these. Older artists, and and they're not they're not asking me about the Beatles or right, the Stones right, 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 or the right. Almond Brothers, right? Which was is really interesting. It's like they skipped in going backwards. They've skipped like a couple of generations, I, to, I, and they come to this stuff. I think our kids. I know my uh, my stepson Nick. We were sitting at breakfast one day. I was in Boise, and he said, "There's this guy." He said, "I've been buying this old vinyl, and there's there's this guy Tony something." And I, I discovered that it's pretty good. And of course, he was talking Bennett. about Tony Bennett. <laughs> and our kids don't have the baggage we had. I mean, we we had some societal baggage right. that you know don't trust they anybody. To reject, to 30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 it it, it kind of created a an unnatural change in our culture. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, artists like Frank Sinatra, Mel Torme, uh, Tony Bennett kind of went away. They did, and and when they tried to, when the record labels tried to young them up by having like Frank Sinatra, I I have bad, never played, bad Leroy Brown. I have never played that song. Oh, on the station. I, I want to gag when I, just at the thought of it. And and Daisy, when when we were working together, told me about her dad. You know, they had him do um, uh, Mel Torme. I think his least favorite song was uh, they had him do. I want to say she said it was the, the games people played the the Joe South song oh. that he covered, and you know was, what I used to, I uh, I was doing a series for Rhino some years ago uh, called Masters of Jazz, mm-hmm. and I did, it came to a vocal album, so you know Rhino was connected with Atlantic, so I, I said, well, Mel Torme was on Atlantic. I'm gonna use it. I'm, I'm going through Mel Torme, Mel Torme, and I said I said I spot a song by my friend Benny Golson, uh, Whisper Not. So I got a chance to 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 make Benny a couple of bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, well, sorry. it was it was a weird time, and now our kids don't have that. Either they see it on YouTube or they they hear it on Spotify or whatever. If they like it, they like it. That's it, right. There's, there's no there's no negative baggage. Right, right. There's there's no uh, generation gap. Right. Yeah. Uh, that, that we that, that our generation. Went through it's all been, that crap. It's been it's been harder to bring uh, baby boomers back to this music yeah, than they're the toughest than their kids, and that's the, the most bizarre thing. And it, it, it's it's the so, kids are hipper than their parents. Yeah, because 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 again, <laughs> the kids have no preconceived notion; they yeah. have no baggage. Um, and and that sounds like that's what you're experiencing. The exactly what I'm getting. experiencing. Yeah. Uh, when you when you did the album. Um, you didn't put a, a lot of songs that have been top 40 hits on the big band. I mean... No, no, well, they might have been in their day. You know, uh, who knows? Of course, the charts were much smaller. There weren't 100 uh, yeah. songs on the charts in, in 1927 you know, or 1935. But, but, I'm, but I'm, uh, the songs that are on Billy Vera Big Band Jazz on the album, the songs that you do in your show when, when you're playing with the band... Aren't songs that you heard on Top 40 Radio in the 60s? Oh, not at all. The, the only one uh, is uh, Since I Fell for You. <laughs> you dog. <laughs> Billy Vera on Martini in the Morning.com, 10 o'clock in the West, playing the greatest songs online, the greatest songs ever written online around the clock and around the world on Martini in the Morning.com from Billy Vera, Big Ben Jazz. Oh, 
Martini in the morning from Billy Bear and Big Band Jess. You know, we were talking off the air. We we always say we at some point in the show we always say we should we should can the 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 conversations that go on <laughs> in between while well, the records playing. It's like we want to play music, but the conversations that we have. We were just talking about the fact that Billy did that song, took a risk really, and did that song differently than than I mean. I grew up with the Lenny, Lenny Welch version of uh, of uh, "Since I Fell for You," and you and you played with Lenny. I played with Lenny many times back in the '60s uh, when he was when his he was his career was really hot. Very nice guy, and uh, and we talked and I, and uh, and we had both Lenny and I had both heard the, the harp tones version from 1960, the doo wop version, and uh, and then and uh, and that's where he, that's where Lenny got his chord changes that are that, that he uses on his record although they're more sophisticated played more sophisticatedly if that's a word so but what I wanted to do I said I don't want to I don't want to be compared with Lenny's incredible version I, I said I'm going to go back to 1945 and do the and, and, and get the chord changes from Buddy Johnson's original version isn't, isn't that the song since I fell for you isn't that the lyric the Musical or lyrics written by a former vice president? No, no, no. You're thinking of uh, uh, Tommy Edwards. It's all in the game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no. I Buddy used to Buddy love Johnson that song too. was a, was a great uh, band leader uh, who mostly played on the road a lot. Yeah. So, but his, but he he made a lot of great records and 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 he wrote a lot of great songs that had become jazz standards, including this one. Excuse me. Are you are you a jazz singer? I, I'm a singer. You know, I, I don't I don't go for uh, Lab labels. Yeah, we talk about that sometimes. We had uh, Tierney Sutton, and and I mean Tierney is is. In fact, Tierney has a, a t-shirt idea. Jazz isn't like you either. <laughs> because she hears from so many people. Yeah. I, don't, I don't like jazz. Well, how do you know you don't like jazz? Do you know jazz? And, well, and, and what is you know what is a jazz singer? Is a jazz singer King Pleasure, or is it uh, you know Nancy Wilson? We have that you debate. Know? We have that debate here all the time because what we play at one time might have been called jazz. Frank Sinatra was called a jazz singer one time, but but by today's standard, is is Frank Sinatra a jazz singer? Is Tony Bennett a jazz singer? No, you know um, um, pop singers. They're great pop singers, but pop became a dirty word. At one point, because the Beatles were pop. Yeah, no. well, well, no, but pop. Sure. I mean, pop music, even when it was, it was Rosemary Clooney and Doris Day, and you know all that stuff. It it became to the boomers that we were talking about before. Yeah. Then then pop became a bad word. Uh -huh. Then they then they revamped the word pop, and yeah. they and it was Beatles and those groups. But and, and now, like our our category in the Grammys is traditional pop vocals yeah and I mean what is jazz what is pop what is what is Billy Vera just, you know I, I as we were talking about Ray Charles before he he's sort of my model I, I never wanted to sing like him because there's only one Ray Charles and why why you yeah. know I don't want to be Joe Cocker you know so but but he's my model in the sense that one minute he's doing uh, R&B, next minute he's doing country and western, yeah. next minute he's doing uh, Ruby, yeah. you know, the next minute he's doing a jazz instrumental album. That's what I wanted to be able to do. I wanted to be allowed. Could you make a living doing that? In this day, in this day and I, age where I, everything is pigeonholed, could you make a living doing that? I'll tell you, if if it wasn't for voiceovers, I don't know what I would do to, to live comfortably. Music business Music business is tough. Sure, you know I mean I, I've been lucky as a songwriter, uh, uh, but I I couldn't live the life that I like to live. <laughs> if it weren't for voiceovers. If it weren't for voiceovers, uh, I couldn't have sent my kids to college. Put it that way. You know. Yes. And that one song. <laughs> oh, that, that song, one song. That song. It's funny. It's funny. I when when I found out that Steve had produced an album, and Steve had no idea that Neil Neil McCoy I've known since the late '80s probably, and um, um, 
I sent Steve a, a listener of ours found out about this album. It hasn't been commercially released. Neil oh. sells it at concerts and so on. And uh, uh, but Steve, it's produced by Steve Tyrell. I didn't know that. So I picked up a uh, I picked up a copy of it, and uh, I said I sent Steve and and John Allen, his co-producer. I sent them a note. And I said you did an album on my favorite Texapino, and they said <laughs> who's that? Well, Neil calls himself Texapino because he's half. He's all Texan, yeah. but his, I think his mom is is Philippine and his dad is Irish. I forget wow. the, the, the whole story, but but anyway, he calls himself a Texapino. Um, Neil Neil years years ago, mm-hmm. back in my previous life as a country disc jockey, did a version of a song called "At This Moment." He was, I think, he was the first person to cover the song because that was in. 88, 89, something oh, yeah, like that. I think so. Back in the eighties. Yeah. yeah. In fact, he called his album at this moment. Yeah. And I and and the first song, the first Neil McCoy song I ever played was at this, at this moment. Wow. He his first single from that album was, was not at this moment, but everybody knew that song. So I you played. wrote that song, Billy. I did. Yeah. Wow. And that and because of that song, you were able to do a, a big band album. Well, thanks to uh, a little boy named Boo Blay. Uh, who, who did a pretty nice version of it and sold about 10 million records. <laughs> I, I used Perfect. one of the checks from, <laughs> from Buble <laughs> to pay for my album. Wow, that's it, it, it pays, it, So it, it pays to be a songwriter. Yeah, and I just made a new deal with uh, Warner Chapel, the publisher, and instead of 50-50... Um, it's ninety ten now, brother. <laughs> really, you get ninety and the, as as before as the administrator as your publisher. They got fifty percent. They got fifty percent plus a, a administration fee, and now and so now. They, but they wanted to renew because you know the copyright ran out, and so now I, I said, That's I said I'd like to keep it with you. I said, but, uh, but we, we got to change a few things. <laughs> It, wow. the, the, being able to write a song is, to me, like magic. We've talked to we we've, we've talked to a number of people um, who who are songwriters. I mean, the inspiration it's got to be it's got to be hard to get to be in, to to get the inspiration to write. It varies, song. you know. Sometimes, you know, Neil Sedaka. I, I remember seeing him on Mike Douglas one time years ago, and Mike asked him those kind of questions, and he says, "I get up." I start writing at 9 a.m., and I write until noon every day. It's a business. It's With him, it's a business. Now, when I was a staff songwriter at a publishing company when I was, like, 21, that's what we did. Uh, uh, and then later, you know, it, it was another way. But some songs will come to you. Like, I had, I've had two number one songs. You know, I, I had At This Moment... Uh-huh. And I had one by Dolly Parton called "I Really Got the Feeling." Oh, I know that song. I, I yeah. played that song. Yeah, in my, Thank my, you. my other life. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know you wrote that. that one came in a different way. I was, I was, I, I had become friends with this guy named L. Russell Brown. Who wrote, I know, I know L. Russell Brown. He wrote "Tie, tie a Yellow Ribbon," and, among others, among many others. Yeah, he wrote uh, Dina Martin's song. Uh, yeah, he wrote two on her album. Uh, uh, where did you learn to love like that? Really and like that. Uh, I think he wrote. Um, I forget. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he, but great he, songwriter. He got a gig, uh, Larry. I call him Larry. He got a gig producing Nancy Sinatra, doing a single session with her. And so uh, one day I was over his house, and he said, "Listen, uh, I I don't have enough songs for Nancy. Uh, you know, I got to pick up my wife at the hairdresser. <laughs> Can you?" start something and we'll finish it when I get back. I said, great. So I said, what do you write for Nancy Sinatra? And I said, well, hmm. She got this famous father. Uh, so I had a line, I love my daddy, but it really don't matter what my daddy might say. And so, you know, and I had another line in there uh, called, uh, when I see your laughing face, <laughs> you know. So he, he, I finished the song in 20 minutes. Larry came back. I played it for him. He loved it. He said, I'm cutting this with Nancy. This is great. Well, he, he, sh- long story short, he, he he played it for Nancy. She hated the song, <laughs> and, and Larry was so mad. He said, "You got to do something with this song, and prove me right." So somehow, I, I won't go in the whole story, but it got to Dolly's people, and uh, and she cut it, and and uh, it became an, my first number one record. Really? Yeah. How did you come up with the song? You wrote a song for Lou Rawls that he cut on. 
Which album was uh, uh, Ruins of You on? Uh, the first one, uh, At Last, the album At Last. So how did you come up with the idea for that song? Well, that one, uh, uh, Paul Gayton, who we mentioned before, mm -hmm. uh, brought Lowell Fulson, the great blues singer, to, to one of my gigs at the Roxy. And... Uh, and he said, you two guys ought to write together. He says, you you know, Lowell's a great blues writer and you're a great songwriter. And so I go down to Lowell's house one afternoon and, and he had an idea. He said, you know, there's this band called Room Full of Blues. He said, we ought to write a song called Room Full of Blues. Maybe they'll record it. You know, he's thinking like a businessman. Yeah, yeah. So we knocked it out again in about 20 minutes. And I went home that that uh, afterwards, and, and I'm sitting there and made myself a little, a little pasta and broccoli and sausage, and I'm looking out the window in my kitchen, and across the, I was living in an apartment at the time, and I'm looking across the courtyard, and there was this beautiful actress that lived across the way, and she's coming out of the shower. Oh my God! And she's got no clothes on. Oh my goodness! And she's walking through the kitchen. She's walking through the living room. You're walking through the bed. And I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking. And I said, man, I got a room with a view of the blues. <laughs> Billy Vera on martiniofthemorning.com <laughs> from the album Billy Vera Big Band Jazz. Martiniofthemorning.com, something that he wrote that uh, that Lou Rawls eventually cut on the, the first album you produced with him. Yeah, that was uh, 1989. The album was called At Last, and that was the album that brought Lou back. Uh, his career back and went to number one on the jazz charts. That was a great version of it last uh, uh, with him and uh, Diane Reeves. Diane Reeves. Yeah. And you know, it, it, for a long time, it was the only Diane Reeves song that we played. Wow. Because she has a tendency to be a little... She's a jazz singer. She's a jazz singer. <laughs> she's, I mean, I mean, she can great find... One. She's a great singer. And she can find so many ways to sing, uh, uh, to do a note. Yeah, yeah, you know, and and um, so you know all, what you ought to play this time of year if that? you can find it. It's on YouTube. Uh, I did. I was asked to do a song for a Christmas album for Blue Note Records uh, some years ago with with Lou and Diane singing "Baby It's Cold Outside." Oh, I've got it. And uh, and uh, Teddy Edwards, who we were talking about before, the great, who was the original bebop tenor saxophone player, the very first. Uh, Teddy plays a beautiful solo for me on that. Um, wait, 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 wait. Maybe it's cold outside. You do have it because you play. Well, while you're looking for it, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a funny story about that session. Okay. Uh, I had Jerry Wiggins on the, on there and his trio, and, and we had to keep a low budget, so it was just a trio. And, and I, I'd hired Teddy, and uh, so Teddy didn't show up at the session. I, I got a cheap studio out in the valley, you know, and I call. So I called Teddy's house, and he answers. And I said, Teddy, you know, we got a session, dude. Uh, you know, he says, I know, man. He said, my ticker was acting up, and I, I'm waiting for the, the nitro to kick in. <laughs> and, and so Teddy, he says, I'll, but I'll be there as soon as I, I feel it. So he gets in his car, he shows up, and, and he played the most beautiful solo. You and then know. he went home and died. Well, he didn't die long after oh. that, I'm afraid. But, uh, you know. That's terrible. I know we have it because I played it for him before. Yeah, um, you have played it. We, we, played it. Uh, you don't play it today, but, but Christmas, you know, years it's a ago, perfect song. Yeah. Years ago, um, a friend of mine uh, was working at, a uh, uh, guy I'd gotten to know, was working at, at Warner Brothers at the studio, and uh -huh. he was in, in charge of music. And... He said, you know, we got the celebrity director, he's done this movie, he's got... And, and he said, I know you don't play a lot of Diane Reeves, and I know why. He said, but but I want you to hear the soundtrack, and, you know, maybe you can help us out. Maybe if we get some airplay on this movie, it'll uh, you know, it'll rescue it. He I mean, it's a black and white, you know, how are we going yeah. to go to video? So he, so 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 I go over to, to, to walk over to Warner Brothers, we're just a block away, and he said, I'll introduce you to the director. He assumed that I knew what movie it was and who the director was. And he might have even mentioned it, and I didn't pay attention. <laughs> What's the name of the movie? I'm dying to know. You're going so long to get to it. Anyway, he yeah. said, "He said the director's here somewhere. He said, oh. when, when I see him, I'll call, call him over to the table. And he brought George Clooney over to the table. Oh, and George God. spent... 10 or 15 minutes while he was shaking my hand, which I haven't watched since. That's my man. <laughs> uh, George spent about 10 minutes telling me how he coached Diane Reeves to, to 
do the songs straight. Wow. With some advice that this uh, advice that he passed on from his aunt Rosemary, and but the basic line was, you know, Diane Reeves doesn't have to prove to people that she knows how to sing, right. and and she sang them straight, and it and as and we play them to this day. What's They're, the name of the song? Good night and good luck. The movie. Ah. Diane Reeves sang. So uh, George Clooney produced her vocal. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. 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 And and they and and Warner and and of course the, the movie ended up winning uh, two Oscars and Golden Globes and they didn't have any trouble with it. It was uh, was in limited release at first because I I, don't, I I honestly don't think Warner Brothers knew what they had. Have you have you had that experience where you've done a, a song for a, for a movie? Uh, I've done a bunch of songs for little movies here and there. Uh, nothing really big ever came out of any of them you, know? you had you had a song on a tv show that was pretty big yeah that that did, did not bad for the old boy billy vera on martini Family and the morning that come <laughs> billy vera you know it's funny that song came out in what 19 well the first time it came 81 out. the 81. first time yeah and and people still if you if you don't do that song People, They'll throw things. People will, yeah. Yeah. People. You know, Jackie Wilson told me when I was a kid, he said, he said, kid, if you ever, he said, kid, if you ever get a hit record, a real hit record, a big hit record, he said, you make sure you do it every single show. He said, because that's the only reason those people are paying those little $2 to come and see you. I had that conversation with, uh, uh, De true. Debbie Boone was there the night you and Steve did that duet. She, yeah. in, fact, in fact, we brought, brought her up on the stage nice at the end. I had that conversation with Debbie. She had such a bad experience with you, Light, Light Up My Life. She didn't want to do it when she did her, her homage to Rosemary Clooney. I said, Debbie. And and like a year later, we you know fast forward, we see each other again because I took my took my wife to see her when she debuted her Rosemary Clooney uh, show, and um, uh, my wife was so disappointed. My, my wife was right in the sweet spot. She was you know that that was a big song when my wife was a was a kid, and uh, we, had, we so a year later we had that same conversation. And 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 Debbie said, by the way, I'm doing that song now in my shows she said I learned a lesson because people came it's Good. like garden party people come to the I'm the sorry you, you, you owe it to them you owe it to your audience to do what they that's can. how they know you that's how they know that's you right. and that's why they're paying their money to see you man it's, it's that's the difference right. between art for art's sake and art as a business yeah and, and Miriam and I have had a conversation this morning regarding the Frank Sinatra tribute last night. I mean, the CBS is there to make money. They're, sell, they're there to sell commercials. The audience, unfortunately, isn't us. The, uh, the audience is 35 to 44 year olds, and they know Carrie Underwood, and they know Adam Levine, and they know, they don't know, I mean, I mean they don't know Frank Sinatra. And they're introducing a whole new generation to that music, to this music, and uh, um, and all of us should be thankful that uh, you know, like on the Grammys years ago, uh, they wanted to do a tribute to Louis and Keeley had the first Grammy, I think, uh, with I think uh, so, that yeah. old black magic, yeah. and and of course Louis um, left us. Today's his birthday. Today's his birthday. He was born 105 years ago today, yeah. and uh, uh, but they they wanted to have Keeley on. To, to commemorate the the first Grammy, and they had Kid Rock sing it with her, and people are like, "Why Kid Rock?" Well, number one, Kid Rock loves this music. Number two, because the demo for the for the Grammy award for that TV show knows Kid Rock, and I bet he did a fine job of it. He did okay, you know. He, well, remember when uh, David Lee Roth had a hit with just just a gigolo, yeah. just uh, gave, gave new birth new birth to it. So. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Little birdie. It's martini in the morning com. Good morning. It's 1030. Billy, thank you. Thanks uh, for Billy, having me. Billy Vera, Big Band Jazz, uh, Catalina's Jazz Club in Hollywood uh, this Wednesday night with special guest, our friend Tamela D'Amico. And uh, it'll be a great show. You know, I've, I, and again, I've seen you do the Big Band show two or three times and uh, at Catalina. And uh, it's always a great show. And, and, and this, what? I'm just going to give the phone number. Okay, go ahead. Area code 323-466-2210.
Make call, it reservations. Call and make call reservations, reservations to see... 323-466-2210. Yeah. To see uh, Billy Vera and the band and uh, a little surprise tribute to Frank Sinatra from a guy who who has uh, produced um, Lou Rawls doing a... Rawls sing Sinatra, yeah. yeah. Uh, Billy Vera, uh, it's always... Uh, we, we learn from your Facebook post. We learn from having you in the studio. Well, I love coming here and, and hanging out with you guys, man. You know, you're always so much fun. And he loves his Pepsi. I love my Pepsi. The nectar of the gods. Yeah.